Uh, so let's begin promptly. <coughs> Loving Father, we pray for more of your spirit. Lord, you've been with us this entire Sabbath. And Lord, we know that the spirit does not operate uh, based upon our clock. And so, Father, as the uh, day draws to a close, we know your spirit will still be able to tabernacle with us. Amen. Father, we ask for the guidance of the Holy Spirit to lead us into the truth. We pray, dear Lord, that you would open up our mind's eye to be able to see these things as they are in Holy Scripture. We pray, dear Father, that the deep and secret things will be made plain to those uh, who love you and follow your commandments. Father, as we seek to take things back to the foundations of our faith, as we seek to go back to the old past, the good way, uh, and that we might walk therein, Father, I pray, dear Lord, that we would see uh, these things in clarity. Bless us, Lord God, with uh, divine understanding. Help us to have the ability to have our finite minds see and understand the mind of the infinite. We ask, dear Lord, for uh, the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us from sin, that we may be presented before your throne uh, perfect, spotless, with exceeding joy. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Before we begin this evening, well, I should say, I, I want to begin this evening with a question uh, to the congregation. And before I ask this question, let me maybe uh, give a little background biblically to the question I want to ask you. And so I want you to open your Bible with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll take our Bibles, we'll go to 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. Because that which I, I want to share with you uh, is very is very vast. We've been going over this uh, throughout the week, as Pastor's been saying. Uh, this is really just to kind of bring a, an ending to the presentation that I've been sharing uh, throughout this week. But I need to give you a little background. Uh, that way you can bring, be brought to speed. So we're in 2 Corinthians 13. We're going to look at verse 1. I want to establish a Bible principle. It's a principle that we as Seventh-day Adventists already understand, we already know, we already use it when it comes to even sharing our faith. So notice what it says in 2 Corinthians 13, beginning with verse 1. And when you're there, then you hear you say amen. Amen. The Bible says, this is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. All right, let me give you one other Bible text. Go to the Old Testament book of Genesis. First book of the Bible, Genesis, and we'll go to chapter 41. We're building, we're, we're looking at a Bible principle that simply uh, shows that upon the testimony of two or three, God establishes something. All right, now as Seventh-day Adventists, we use this principle. We are not ones that will give one Bible text for what we believe. We don't just go to the Ten Commandments to prove the Sabbath. We can go all over the Word of God. Amen? Amen. We understand that it's really other religions, other faith that may go into the Bible, see one thing, one time in Scripture, and base a doctrine on it. We're not the ones that do so. When it comes to the Bible, God establishes things upon the testimony of two or three. But at least you need two things to give witness, testimony, clarity, and to establish a Bible truth. Notice what your Bible says in Genesis 41, looking at verse 32. The Bible says in Genesis 41, looking at the 32nd verse, And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. When God does something once, it's powerful. But when he does something twice, it's established. Amen. Amen. All right. So th this is just a, a, a just two texts. We've established it by two texts. It's established. All right. Amen. Well, the testimony of two of things established. So by two texts, we've established the principle that upon the testimony of two of things established. So now the question. This is a question that we need to really ponder for a moment. I want to ask you, and then I want you to really think about this question, and then we're going to go to our Bible. As Seventh-day Adventists, the foundation and pillar truth for our faith is the 2300-day prophecy. Daniel 8, 14. Amen? Amen. 
Daniel 8, 14, we know correctly, ends October 22nd, 1844. Amen? Amen. But in order for that to be true, we need a second witness. So I want you to think about something for a moment. As a Seventh-day Adventist, what is the second witness in the Bible to October 22nd, 1844? Have we ever heard preach the second witness to October 22nd, 1844? Because according to Bible principle, there has to be established, you can only establish something based upon it being there at least twice. So where is the other prophecy that points to October 22nd, 1844? The way that we have been going for years in Adventism proves that we have forgotten and lost that second witness. But that's not how Adventism began. When Adventism began, Millerite Adventism, that leads into Seventh-day Adventism. Adventists always proved and tested and showed the 2300-day prophecy, October 22nd, 1844, based upon not one, but two witnesses. And remember, upon the testimony of two, something is established. So we might believe October 22nd, 1844, but based upon how we have been studying God's word and teaching God's word publicly in our books, in our discourses, we're really showing that we don't really believe it's established. But God has established this thing, brethren. I want you to take a look just for a moment. The 1843 and the 1850 chart. And because... This is a vast subject. I usually take about 12 presentations to make sure we at least scratch the surface. All right, because it's all through the Word of God. We're going to do, we're going to try to bring you up to speed in about an hour. But if you look at the very top of the 1843 chart, which early writings, page 74, says was directed by the hand of the Lord. And then when you look at the 1850 chart here on my right, uh, this chart is also directed by God's hand. Sister White is very clear in saying that God showed her that these charts were a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. These charts were a fulfillment of the book of Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, which says, write the vision and make it plain upon what? Tables. tables, that he may run that read of it. These are the two tables where the vision has been made plain. Mm -hmm. And SOP is very clear, the Spirit of Prophecy is very clear that these are a fulfillment of that prophecy. So, when we take a look at the 1843 chart, it's also on the 1850, but the 1843 chart is very pronounced. It's right there at the top, top right hand corner. You have the longest time prophecy in the Bible, not the 2300 days, but the 2520 years. Mm -hmm. This is the 2520 years prophecy of Moses, of Leviticus 26. All right, we've been studying these things together, and so now I want to kind of just bring you up to speed just a little bit. Turn your Bible with me to the book of Daniel. Go with me to Daniel. And what I'm about to share with you, I, I'm confident that most of us have never even heard of the 25 point. And the reason for it is because at the very, the, at the very beginning, when the church went from being a movement to being an incorporated status quo established four wall church, this was the first doctrine that was sealed up. And it's also a fulfillment of prophecy. We're gonna show you these things in the Bible. So I'm quite confident that we have never heard of these things. What I'm about to present to you is not new. It's not new. This was the first prophecy that led William Miller's understanding to October 22nd, 1844, or when he first understood the end of the world would end 1843. But we know that was a mistake. But notice what your Bible says in Daniel chapter 8. And I want to look just with you at verse 13. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 13. We can't go through a whole Bible study on these verses, but there's a simple question asked. And you can see it very clearly in your uh, King James Bible, your English version. Notice what it says, Daniel chapter 8 and verse 13. And again, when you're with me, amen. amen. The Bible said, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to get both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Now, when you read verse 13, 
The question is one of duration. How long shall be the vision concerning two powers, two things, the daily, and notice I'm not saying the daily sacrifice, because again, early writings, page 74, she's very clear in saying that the Lord has shown her that the word sacrifice does not belong to the text, that it was placed there by man's wisdom. Where is that again? Early writings, page 74. Early writings, page 74. So it says, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? So whatever the daily and whatever the transgression of desolation is, it tramples the sanctuary and the host underfoot. All right, that's the work of the daily and the transgression of desolation. Now, on the charts, uh, both 1843, 1850 charts, the writings of the spirit of prophecy and the pioneers, the understanding of the daily is that it's paganism. Starting with Babylon being pagan, Medo-Persia being pagan, Greece being pagan, pagan Rome being pagan, these are the powers that trampled underfoot both the sanctuary and the host. But then it says the transgression of desolation, which is a symbol of the papacy. So both paganism and the papacy trample underfoot the people of God. All right, now I know I'm, I'm going through these things very fast, but that's because we don't have time to give you all of the proof text to make it clear. But the Bible shows that these powers trample underfoot both the sanctuary and the host. And remember, it's a question that certain saint which spake is Jesus. The one asking the question is Gabriel. And Gabriel is saying, how long should be the complete vision of paganism and the papacy to trample underfoot both the sanctuary and the host, the people of God. And what is the answer? Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. But remember the question in verse 13 is about the sanctuary and the host. Verse 14 gives you the answer for the sanctuary. But what about the host? Why do we always leave that out? The Bible asks two questions, one for the sanctuary, one for the host. 1844, October 22nd, when it comes to our understanding of the 2300 days, which we have correct answers for the sanctuary, but what about the host? The question is twofold. The answer must be twofold. Right. And we're going to show you that the 2300 days points to the sanctuary being cleansed, but the 2520 deals with the host no longer being trampled. All right, we're going to show you these things in the Bible. So this is what our study has been about. Now since we're in Daniel chapter 8, let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Just jump to Daniel chapter 9. And Daniel understands, we know a Seventh-day Adventist, that, that Gabriel never really explained fully the 2300 days to Daniel. And so he begins to study the book of Jeremiah. And he begins to see that, that Jerusalem, the sanctuary, uh, and Palestine was to be laid waste for 70 years because they would be in captivity in Babylon. And as he's praying, notice what Daniel says in chapter 9. Let's just begin in verse, verse 8 together. It says, O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of faces, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belongeth mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we opened, obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel has transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they may not obey thy voice. Therefore the what? Curse. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the what? Oh. And the oath that is written where? In the law of Moses the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Now notice, Daniel, read, Daniel understands clearly the reason why God's people were in captivity in Babylon was because they had broke the law. They had broke the commandments. They had broke his statutes. They had broken his judgments. And so because of this, they have now been scattered into the heathen nation. And the Bible says that he knew that the curse and the oath of Moses was being poured out upon them. Brethren, what is the curse and oath of Moses? Well, first of all, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of, the book of uh, Exodus. Turn with me in, in your Bible to the book of Exodus. 
And all of these things uh, that we're going to be going over have been uh, placed on record uh, numerous times, whether it be audio or DVD or, or even, even in print, and we can provide you with all of these tools to be able to study these things. But we're in Exodus chapter 34. Exodus 34, because Daniel understood that the people of God had broken the covenant. And because they had broken the covenant, now the curse and oath of Moses was being poured out upon them. So we're in Exodus 34. What is the covenant based upon? Exodus 34. Let's just begin in verse 27. Exodus 34, beginning with verse 27. When you're there with me, let me hear you say amen. Amen. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words have I made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread, neither drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the what? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. We read in Daniel chapter 9, because the law of God was broken, now they're having the curse and oath of Moses poured out upon them. Now, we know in Scripture, this is something that is very familiar to us. Moses, in the book of Leviticus, in the book of Deuteronomy, he comes before the people at the direction of the Lord and says, Listen, if you keep the law of God, blessings will be upon you. And he gives you a whole list of blessings. As a matter of fact, Deuteronomy 27 and 28 and 29 and 30 goes over these blessings and cursings. Blessings if you keep them, but what if you break them? curses. He comes before, uh, uh, Moses comes before them and he commands them saying, listen, when you're going into the land of promise, you're going to have half of the tribes stand upon Mount Gerizim and half of the tribes are going to stand upon Mount Ebal and they're going to repeat the law of God. And Mount Gerizim is a symbol of the blessings. Mount Ebal is a symbol of the cursings. And if you keep the law, you're blessed. If you break the law, you're cursed. This was a re-entering re uh, re of the covenant before they went into the promised land. So the covenant is based upon God's law. Now, when we go to the book of Leviticus, and I want you to turn there with me now, Leviticus 26. And what I'm doing now is simply trying to bring you up to speed as it were. When you look at Leviticus chapter 26, Leviticus chapter 26 deals with both the curse and the oath of Moses. Right? Leviticus 26 deals with both the curse and the oath. And I want you to keep your finger in Leviticus 26. But flip over with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Just flip over to the book of Deuteronomy. Keeping a marker or something in Leviticus 26. But turning to Deuteronomy. I want you to go with me now to chapter 28. Deuteronomy, what chapter are we going to? 28. Chapter 28. When you read Deuteronomy 28, it also was dealing with the, uh, the curses of Moses. All right? Did you raise your hand, Pastor? No, no, no. Oh, okay. All right. So we're, we're dealing in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And this is also dealing with the curses. And I want you to see how complete these curses are. When, that, when, when Moses is listing out the curses that are to come upon them, I want you to see how complete it is and how far these curses carry forward into the future. All right, the pastor asked a good question in our studies. He was saying, wait a minute. 2,520 years, as the pioneers and early Adventists proclaimed, is a great, a long period of time. It covers both ancient Israel and spiritual Israel. And the question was asked, would spiritual Israel be punished because of ancient Israel's sins? I mean, that just, that, that, that kind of boggles the mind. Would God do something like this? Well, notice what Moses says. So we're in, we're in the book of Deuteronomy 28. We're going to begin in verse 45. Deuteronomy 28, begin with verse 45. The Bible says, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee, and overtake thee, till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee, and they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder upon thy seed forever, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore shall thou serve thine enemies which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of brass upon thy neck. Iron. 
he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he has destroyed thee. Remember this iron yoke. It says the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt what? Not understand a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor shall favor to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee neither corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep, or thy sheep, until he has destroyed thee, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Now, brethren, notice this. On your own time, take Deuteronomy 28 and just read through it, and he's dealing with all these curses. But this final portion of the curse, he says God is going to send a nation from far, represented by a yoke of iron. He said this nation would have a king of fierce countenance or a kingdom of fierce countenance. Their language would not be able to be understood by them. And what was he going to do to them? He was going to besiege them and destroy them. Now, brethren, in the book of Daniel, don't turn there, just write it down for time. In the book of Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 8, you can write down verses 20 uh, uh, through 24. Or 25, Daniel chapter 8, verse 20 through 25. And Daniel, uh, Gabriel begins to describe to Daniel the vision of chapter 8. What the ram of the two horns represent, what the eagle represents, and what this little horn power represents. And he shows in Daniel chapter 8 that this little horn power, a symbol of Rome, was a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences. In other words, they would not understand their language. So when Moses prophesied of the destruction to come upon his people, he took them all the way down the end of time, past Babylon, past Medo-Persia, past Greece, all the way to Rome. Now Rome comes in two phases. In Daniel chapter 8, it's simply called the little horn. Just like in chapter 7, you have the little horn, but in chapter 7, the little horn is papal Rome. In chapter 8, the little horn is both pagan and papal Rome. We studied this already together, uh, so we can't go back that far. But pagan Rome and papal Rome represent a king of fierce countenance, and they understand dark sentences. And isn't Roman Bible prophecy the Iron King? Yeah. Amen. Yes, it is. So Moses takes you all the way past ancient Israel, all the way into spiritual Israel. As a matter of fact, he takes you all the way past the head of gold, all the way past the breast and arms of silver, all the way past the belly and thighs of brass, through the legs of iron, down to the feet of iron and clay, because iron is a symbol of civil power, and clay is a symbol of church power, and what is the papacy but a combination of church and state? Amen. And so he takes you all the way through the kingdoms of Bible prophecy to the end. So when the Bible is talking about the curse of Moses, it's not just that which comes upon ancient Israel but it carries over to spiritual Israel as well. All right, these are some things I want you to remember. So turn back to Leviticus 26. Almost done with the recapitulation, and then we'll, we'll start uh, getting into the Bible. The Bible says in Leviticus 26, looking at verse uh, 18, Leviticus 26, beginning with verse 18. And when you're with me, amen. Amen. The Bible says, if you will not get for all this hearken unto me, then will I punish you seven times more for your sins. And I will break the pride of your power and will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass and your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. And if you will walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. And I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, and destroy your cattle, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if ye will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you, and will punish you yet what? Seven, Seven times for your sins. Now notice the difference. Moses, he's giving these curses, saying that there will be seven times more. Now, I remember how my daddy used to do me when I was younger. 
if one punishment, one, one corporal punishment, one spanking was enough, wasn't enough, and that didn't reform me, sometimes he would give me seven times more uh, punishment. And if that didn't work, if corporal punishment didn't work, then he would give me time. And I hated that the most. You see, it's faking the last for a little while, the sting, it hurts, tears will flow, but then you can go out and play later on that day. But when daddy says you can't go out for seven weeks, or you, you, you're, in, you're in your room for two months, that hurts. God is a faithful father. And so he punishes his children with increased judgments. First, you know, you're, you're, you're going to your land, but it won't yield its increase. And if that doesn't reform you, I'm going to give you seven times more punishment. The Bible says, I'll send beasts into the land that will rob you of your children. They will eat your children. But if that doesn't work, I'm going to punish you seven times for your sins. Not seven times more, but seven times. In the book of Leviticus, you have the curse and the oath. Daniel chapter 9, verse 11, that word oath in the original language means to seven one's self. To, to repeat something seven times. By implication, it's a week. It's a length of time. And that's the same word in Leviticus 26. The word seven times is a prophecy. Now, what the Memorites understood, and I'm going to write it here, and then I might have to erase it because our board is small. A time in Bible prophecy is one year. One year in Bible prophecy is not 365 days, but 360 days. Now the way you can show 360 days is in Genesis chapter 7 and Genesis chapter 8. When you look at the flood, it was on the second month, 17th day of the month, that the waters began to fall upon the earth. And the waters lasted upon the earth 150 days. You go on to Genesis chapter 7, it was on the seventh month, 17th day of the month, that the waters were abated. How many months between second month and seventh month? Five months, but the Bible says 150 days. So five into 150 gives you 30 days in a Bible month, 12 months in a Bible year, 360. All right, so there's 360 days in a Bible year. And so seven times, or seven years, prophetically, is 2,500 and 20 days, or as we understand in Adventist when it comes to Adventism, when it comes to prophetic time, it's not 2,520 days, but 2,520 years. The day is a year of Bible prophecy. So with all of this background now, now I want to get into the nitty gritty. Is that all right? Amen. Is that all right? We're all hopefully at least a little bit brought up to speed. When God made his covenant with Israel, how many tribes were involved when the law was spoken from Sinai? How many tribes? How many tribes? Twelve. Twelve tribes. All the tribes of Israel were represented there. But when you come to the time period of Solomon, something happens in 1 Kings chapter 11. In 1 Kings chapter 11, because of the sins of Solomon, and, 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 and Elder Taylor went there earlier today. In 1 Kings chapter 11, the Bible shows that he loved many strange women. The wives of Ashdod, the wives of Moab, the wives of Hammon, the Hittites, the Zidonians, all these different heathen wives, he, he, he claved to them in love. The Bible said he had 700 wives, 300 concubines, and he made idols and houses of worship for all of his wives. That means 700 of them. That means Israel was full of idolatry because of the sins of Solomon. And as a result, the Bible says that he was going to he was going to rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give it to his servant. But he promised Solomon, saying, this is all in 1 Kings chapter 11, he promised Solomon, saying, I will not rend it out of your hands when, when you're living, but out of the hand of your son, whose name is Jeroboam, or excuse me, Rehoboam. His servant, 1 Kings chapter 11, is Jeroboam. Jeroboam, he's walking outside, he has a new coat on him, the prophet Ahijah comes and takes his coat and tears it into 12 pieces and says, 10 pieces I'm going to give to you. In other words, you're going to receive 10 tribes, while Solomon's son is going to receive two tribes, which was Judah and Benjamin. All right, so when Israel is divided into two, they're divided into the north, which is called Israel in the Bible, that's the 10 tribes. Their capital city is Samaria. That's where you get into the New Testament, you start hearing about the Samaritans. All right, and there's a rift between the Jews 
and the Samaritans. All right, this takes you all the way back to the divisions of Israel. Okay, so 1 Kings chapter 11 is where you have this division. Israel is the ten northern tribes. The two southern tribes are called Judah, and the capital city is Jerusalem. We all together so far? Amen. All right, amen. So, follow me now. Follow me now. Leviticus chapter 26 is where we're at. I want to read a few things, go to our board, and then we're going to start tearing up the Bible. So, Leviticus 26, the Bible says in verse 24, Then will I also walk contrary unto you, and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send a pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat and not be satisfied. And if ye will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. I want you to notice that this seven times period, the oath is mentioned twice. The oath is mentioned twice. Seven times. The Bible goes on to say in verse 20, uh, verse 30, excuse me, verse 29, and ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. And it goes down saying how he would break down their images, cast their carcasses upon the carcasses of their idols, desolate their sanctuaries. Brethren, this is a serious thing that was to take place upon Israel. But let me ask you this. With every time prophecy, we have to have a beginning. Amen? Amen. And we have to have an end. When it comes to the 2300 days, we know that Daniel 9 takes us to the beginning when it comes to the 70 weeks. We know that's 457 B.C. And the reason why we know it's the beginning of the prophecy is because of the historical events that were fulfilled. Because history fulfills prophecy. Amen? Amen? So where do we begin? If the 2,520 years is correct, well, it has to have a starting point. Amen. So how do we know where to begin the 2520? Well, the clue is in the video is 26. When the first 2520 is mentioned, the first seven times is mentioned, God said he's going to gather his people in their city, and their, the uh, enemies would be round about them, and he would break the staff of their bread. What does this sound like to you? When you're gathered in your city, Enemies are surrounding you, and your food is running out. Siege. It's a siege. You look at Ezekiel chapter 4. Ezekiel chapter 4 is all about a siege, and it talks about the breaking of their staff of bread. So the first 2520 is connected with the siege. What about the second 2520 mentioned? The Bible said you would eat the flesh of your sons and of your daughters. Well, when you read about that in Scripture, when did they ever eat the flesh of their sons and daughters? In a siege. Both 2520s are connected with a siege. All right, so very important. We're studying the Bible, how the Millerites study the Bible. Now, Israel was divided into two parts. Israel was divided into two parts. And you have to forgive me, I have to draw a little small uh, because of the size of the board. The first line we're going to show is northern Israel. The bottom line is southern Israel, or southern people of God. This is Judah. Israel, Judah. Now, your Bible tells you in the book of Isaiah chapter 7. Go with me there. Isaiah chapter 7. Now we're going to begin to get into the Bible. Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. And I want to begin in verse 1 with you. Isaiah chapter 7, beginning with the first verse. Isaiah chapter 7, what, what verse are we going to? One. Verse 1. When you're with me, let me hear you say amen. Amen. The Bible says, And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of, Israel, of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved in the heart of his people, as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. 
And it says, Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and share Jashub thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool, in the highway of the fuller's field. And say unto him, Take heed, and be quiet, fear not, neither be faint-hearted, for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria, and the son of Remaliah. It says, Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiol. Now, what we have taking place here is there is a civil war. There's a civil war. I want you to remember these things. There's a civil war taking place. Uh, Pekah, who is the king of Israel, is now joined in a confederacy with, with Rezin, the king of Syria. And they're going to fight against Judah. So there is a civil war between the north and the south. Are you all together so far? Yes. Amen. All right. There's a civil war between the north and the south. Isaiah is sent by God to, to Ahaz king of Judah. And he said, and he says, listen, what's about to take place is not going to come to pass. Don't worry. Don't worry. And notice what he now says in verse 7. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, the head of Damascus is resin, and within how long? Three score and five years. How long is three score and five? 65. 65 years. Within 65 years shall Ephraim be broken that it be not a people. Now Ephraim, brethren, if you can, if you look in verse 1 and 2, first it talks about how uh, Israel is coming against Judah. Then it says Ephraim is coming against Judah. Ephraim is another name for Israel. So the Bible is saying, Isaiah is prophesying, saying within 65 years, Israel, Ephraim, would be broken that it be not a people. All right, now, Bible chronologers, Bible chronologers, they place the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 7 in 723, excuse me, yes, 723, 742 B.C., 742 B.C., 742 B.C. Can everybody see that? In 742 B.C., this is when Isaiah makes his proclamation that within 65 years, Ephraim would be broken. You can read about this in James Usher's chronology. His book is called The Annals or the Annals of World History. All right, so 742 B.C., this is when you have this civil war between the north and the south. And the Bible said within 65 years, Ephraim would be broken. Now, historically, in the year 723 B.C., 19 years later, 19 years later, Ephraim is besieged by the king of Assyria. The name of the king is Shalamanzer. I'm giving you a lot of history because I'm going to get past this. 723 B.C., Shalamanzer, king of Assyria, comes against Ephraim and besieges him. All right, and remember, the 2520, the seven times, begins with what? A siege. A siege. All right, 723 B.C. is where you begin the 2520 years for the northern tribes. So if you take 723 B.C., you add 2520 years to it, you come to the year 1798. Is that, is that a well-known date in Adventism? Yes. 1798. The deadly wound being inflicted upon the papacy, Revelation 13, verse 3. So 723 B.C., northern tribes goes into captivity under Shalemanzer, the king of Assyria, 2,520 years brings you to 1798. But remember, the prophecy said within 60, how long? Five. 65 years shall Ephraim be broken. So this is a 65-year period that's prophesied. And 46 years later, in other, 1946 make a full 65, 46 years later, in 677 B.C., the southern tribe goes into captivity. Manasseh is carried into captivity by Esarhaddon, king of Assyria. All right? So 723 B.C., northern tribe goes into captivity. 
677 BC, Manasseh goes into captivity. The autonomy uh, of, of Israel is broken. They are now under the rulership of pagan kings from this point forward. All right, this is 677 BC. And then after this, this is when you have the unleashing of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar comes in his three sieges and destroys and lays waste Jerusalem and the temple. We all know that history. Okay? This is the history that, remember, Daniel is praying, and he's saying he knew the curse of Moses and the oath was poured out upon them. This was a direct result of what took place in 677. All right, so Daniel understands this history. Well, quickly now, 677 B.C., if we add 2,520 years, we come to the year 1844. Mm. Amen. Amen. All right, so... The 2520, the 2520 gives us a second witness to October 22nd, 1844. Therefore, with the 2300 days and the 2520, it's established. 2300 days is firmly established. Amen. All right, the 2520 does not carry after 1844. We're not ones that put time prophecy after 1844. I'm going to make that very well known because there are people who will battle the 2520 saying that we're, 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 Futurists, we're, we're setting time with the 2520. No, brethren. 677, is that past or future? Past. 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 BC. 1844, past or future? Past. 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 So I can look back into the past and put a date on something, and that's not time setting. You're a time setter if I say, hey, uh, uh, 2012, the Sunday law is in Athens. Or 2012, uh, uh, October 13th, the Sunday law. Then you're a time setter. All right, but when you look into the past, you're not setting time. All right, so this is where we've gotten in our study. Now what I want you to do with me is turn your Bible to the book of Lamentations. Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Lamentations. We're going to Lamentations chapter 2. Lamentations chapter 2. And, and I have to apologize because we're cutting a lot out at this particular point in time. But by God's grace, you'll have enough to at least see uh, what the pioneers have seen. So we're in Lamentations chapter 2. Let's begin with verse 1 together. Lamentations chapter 2. We're going to begin in what verse? Verse 1. Verse 1. Lamentations 2 and verse 1. The Bible says, How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger? And cast down from heaven unto the earth the beauty of Israel, and remembered not his footstool in the day of his what? Anger. Anger. The Lord hath swallowed up all the habitations of Jacob, and hath not pity. He hath thrown down in his wrath the strongholds of the daughters of Judah. He hath brought them down to the ground. He hath polluted the kingdom and the princes thereof. He hath cut off in his fierce anger all the horn of Israel. It says, and, and he hath drawn back his right hand from before the enemy. He hath burned against Jacob like a flaming fire which devoureth round about. He hath bent his bow like an enemy. He hath stood with his right hand as an adversary and slew all that were pleasant to the eye in the tabernacle of the daughter of Zion. He hath poured out his one. Fury like fire, the Lord was an enemy. It says the Lord was an enemy. He hath swallowed up Israel. He hath swallowed up all her palaces. He hath destroyed his strongholds and hath increased in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. He hath violently taken away his tabernacle as if it were a, of a garden. He hath destroyed his flat palaces. His places of assembly, the Lord hath caused the solemn feasts and the Sabbaths to be forgotten in Zion. He hath despised in the indignation of his anger the king and the priest. Now notice the wording here. He keeps mentioning his anger, his fury, his indignation. When you read Deuteronomy chapter 29, you can take verses 25 through 29 of Deuteronomy 29. And the Bible shows that the people of the world would come and say, what means this great wrath that God has poured out upon his people? And the answer would be because they have broken the covenant. Therefore, he has poured out upon them his anger, his wrath, his indignation. Now, something Elder Taylor was dealing with. He was showing God's anger, his wrath, his indignation at the end of the world or the plagues. And we're going to show you something. Because the 2520 merely, brethren, is not just about the past. There's a principle in the 2520. 
And that is the principle of the scattering and the gathering. Amen. Read Leviticus 26. Read Leviticus 26. God said that he would scatter his people among the heathen. But if they would repent, they would be gathered. I see your hand, Pastor. I see your hand, but we're recording. But we'll take, we'll take questions out. So they would be gathered if they would repent. Read Leviticus 26, the last 10 verses. Read the last 10 verses of Leviticus 26. And as a result of their repentance, as a result of the confession of their sins, God would gather them. The, the 2520 is the principle of the scattering and the gathering. And if you understand this principle, it's written by all the prophets. The scattering and the gathering is the principle of Bible prophecy. Mm. So when you're reading Levit Lamentations chapter 2, God says he's angry with them. He's going to pour out his wrath upon them, his great indignation. And notice what it says in verse, beginning with verse 7. The Lord hath cast off his altar, he hath abhorred his sanctuary, he hath given up into the hand the enemies, the walls of her palaces, they have made a noise in the house of the Lord, as in the day of a solemn feast. The Lord hath purposed to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion, he hath done what? Stretched out, Stretched out a line. I know Pastor Taylor's with me. Yes. But what about the rest of us? Are we all together? Amen. All right. So what does the Bible say? It says the Lord in verse 8, the Lord hath purpose to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. He hath done what? Stretched out a line. He hath not for withdrawn his hand from destroying. Therefore he made the rampart and the wall to lament. They languish together. Her gates are sunk into the ground. He hath destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the Gentiles. Gentiles, the law is no more. Her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. Because God's anger and wrath was poured upon them, God said he stretched out what upon them? A line. A line. What is this line he stretches out upon them? Turn to 2 Kings. Turn your Bible with me to 2 Kings 21. Go with me to 2 Kings 21. 2 Kings 21, beginning with verse 8. 2 Kings 21, what verse are we going to? Verse 8. Verse 8 together. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Kings 21, verse 8, Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I gave their fathers. It says, Only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they hearkened not, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did all the nations who the Lord with, with who the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake by his servant the prophet, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall what? Tingle. Tingle. In other words, whatever I'm about to do to the land is so great, so marvelous, so furious, that whoever hears about it, their ears are going to tingle. Now I want to pause here for a moment. God made a covenant with both, or I should say all of the tribes of Israel. Amen? Amen. The basis of the covenant was the Ten Commandments. If I keep the covenant, I'm blessed. If I break the covenant, I'm cursed. Amen? Amen. Israel was split into two, north and south, but does that change God's covenant? No. No, it doesn't change the covenant. And as a matter of fact, if you read 1 Kings chapter 11, God specifically told Jeroboam that if he kept the covenant, God would make his kingdom last forever. And the same promise is given to the southern tribes. But the northern tribes broke the covenant, so the oath and the curse was poured out upon them. Now, some people would say, well, wait a minute. If the curse was given to Israel as a whole, how are you saying there are two 2520s? Well, think of it this way. Well, the Bible mentions it twice, and maybe that's not enough for you, but think of it this way. God is fair. Amen? Amen. If, 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 if my elder here and myself were committing crime together, if we're out in the world committing crime, and we go and we rob a bank, and I get caught, but he gets away. And for six months, or let's say six years, he's on the run. I go to trial, and I'm given ten years, and I begin my sentence. Then six years later, he gets caught for the same crime, and he's given ten years. 
Is his time going to be, is his time going to uh, 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 just end when mine ends? No. Or is he going to get the same 10 years, therefore his time will end six years further than mine? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so the point is this. If the 2520 was poured out upon the northern tribes, some people say, well, how are you extending it past 1798? Why to 1844? Well, 46 years later is when Judah broke the covenant. When Judah as a whole committed national apostasy under Manasseh, and so now God pours out his fury upon them, his wrath, his great indignation. And so from 677 to 1844, you have this, but the way that God illustrates it is he says upon Judah, he's going to stretch upon them a what? Line. A line. What line is this? This is what we're talking about. So we're in 2 Kings. Notice what it says. Once again, verse 12. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of who? Samaria. Samaria. And the plummet of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish. Wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. And they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies. Because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt. Now brethren, the Bible said that upon Judah in Lamentations chapter 2, God was in the stretch upon them alive. What line is this? Second Kings tells you it's the line of Samaria. What was the line of Samaria? Northern Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom, but it's the line of prophecy given to them. This oath, this is the 2520. This same line is now going to be stretched over Judah. Let me give you it in another way, just so you're saying, ah, oh, you're stretching that a bit. Let me show you. That Judah is going to drink to the very dregs the very fury that God poured upon her sister Samaria. Yes. Turn your Bible with me to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to Ezekiel 23. Ezekiel 23. Let's begin together in verse 28. Ezekiel 23. Verse 28. Ezekiel 23, what verse are we going to? Verse 28. The Bible says, well, we're all there, amen. Amen. The Bible says, for thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will deliver thee into the hand of them whom thou hatest, into the hand of them whom, from whom thy mind is alienated. They shall deal with thee hatefully, and shall take away all thy labor, and shall leave thee naked and bare, and the nakedness of thy whoredoms shall be discovered, both thy lewdness with thy whoredoms. And, and, and thy whoredoms, and will do these things unto thee because thou hast gone a whoring after the heathen, and because thou art polluted with their idols, thou hast walked in the way of thy sister. Therefore will I give her cup into thine hand. Thus saith the Lord God, thou shalt drink of thy sister's cup deep and large. Thou shalt be laughed to scorn and had in derision. It containeth much. In other words, whatever's in this cup, it contains much. It's full. It says, Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, with the cup of astonishment and desolation, with the cup of thy sister who? Samaria. Samaria. Thou shalt even drink it and do what? Yeah. Suck it out. In other words, you're getting every drop. And thou shalt break the shirts thereof and pluck off thine own breasts. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast forgotten me and cast me behind thy back, therefore bear thou also thy lewdoms, uh, excuse me, thy, thy lewdness with thy whoredoms. That which was given to the northern tribe, whose cup contained much, it was deep and large. Judah now has to drink it and suck it out. Everything Samaria receives, Judah's going to receive. And Samaria received 2,500 and 20 years, seven times. So therefore, Judah receives 2,500 and 20 years, seven times. All right, now, let's transition a bit in our study. Turn your Bible with me to the book of Luke. Now, brethren, you have to keep me honest on time. What time do we have? Uh, say, um, ten, ten, ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. All right, so I'm going to have to say a lot of things without uh, going to the Bible unless 
the congregation grants me a bit more time. But notice what it says in Luke 21. Luke 21. And let's start our Bibles in Luke 21 and verse 24. Luke 21 and verse 24. And when you're there, amen. amen. The Bible says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the what? Gentiles. Times plural of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, remember this in your mind, but let me make just a statement. When you look at the 1843 and 1850 charts, and you take Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, uh, Christ's uh, prophetic sermon. Most of us are familiar with Matthew 24, mm -hmm. wars and rumors of wars, nations against nations, the time of tribulation, sun and the moon being dark. We're, we're, we're familiar with these things. Amen. But when you take these things and you study them out in the order that they're given, and the order they're given is completely found in an orderly fashion in Luke 21. Luke, the book of Luke, as a matter of fact, if you take Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, Luke tells you that what he's about to do, other people have written their gospel, but he says, it, it behooves me to write unto you the things that have happened in their order, that you may know of a certainty the things which you believe. So Luke writes things in an orderly fashion, and when you study Christ's gospel sermon, the gospel sermon that he said is to go to all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And brethren, what message goes to all the world? To every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Everlasting gospel. Everlasting gospel. The first, second, third angel. When you understand this principle, what Jesus is preaching in, in Luke 21, Mark 13, Matthew 24 is the first, second, and third angel. But guess what Jesus does? He takes each and every one of the principles found on the 1843 and 1850 chart, and he begins to go at them in their order. And he begins with the daily. The next thing he starts with is the 2520. Then he goes into the sun, moon, and stars. Then he gets into Millerite history and deals with Islam and Bible prophecy. And oh, I wish we had time. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wish we had time. Islam is, is a power in Bible prophecy, not just in the past. And you can see this on the charts where the Mohammedans, our pioneers correctly understood the fifth and the sixth trumpet was Islam. But they believed the world was coming to an end in 1844, so therefore the seventh trumpet was the end of the world. But remember, there's a third wool. There's a first wool, fifth trumpet. Second wool, sixth trumpet. Third wool, seventh trumpet. And there's a Bible principle. It's a principle of Bible prophecy. It's in, without giving it a big name, I'll just say one plus two equals what? Three. Three. You take the history of the first trump, first wool, which is the sixth, fifth trumpet. Second bowl, which is the sixth trumpet, it equals the seventh trumpet, third bowl. And if the first bowl is Islam, and the second bowl is Islam, the third bowl is Islam. 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 Amen. You can do that with Rome, because there's three Romes in prophecy. Pagan Rome, Papal Rome, and then Papal Rome's deadly wound healed, which we will call modern Rome for to give you an understanding of the difference there. And what happens to Pagan Rome happens to Papal Rome. Therefore, what happened to modern Rome? There's three Elijahs in the Bible. There's literal Elijah. There's John the Baptist who was called Elijah. And there's the Elijah that's to come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which is Seventh-day Adventism, we're told in the spirit of prophecy. And the history of the first Elijah plus the second Elijah equals the history of the third Elijah. Amen. First Elijah had to deal with the threefold union, three enemies, which was Ahab, Jezebel, and the false prophet. John the Baptist had to deal with three enemies, which were also a civil power and a religious power. The enemy of John the Baptist is Herod. Then you have Herodias, and then you have her heart and daughters, or her heart and daughters, Salome. But when you come to our day, we have three enemies, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Amen. One is a civil power, the other a religious power, and the other power is the one that does the deceiving, which is the false prophet. It does the work of the false prophets in the days of Elijah. It does the work of Salome, the dance of deception, in the days of John the Baptist. Brethren, our history repeats, remember, upon the testimony of two or three, a thing is established. Amen. And so Christ takes every one of these things on the charts and preaches them. This is the message that's to go to all the world. But what has happened to Adventism? 
What's happened to Adventism? Out of your own mouths, brethren. Out of your own mouths, we don't preach these things anymore. Amen. But we were saying that if we preach these things, then the churches would be filled. Do we really believe that? Because if we really believe it, this is the message that needs to go to all the world. And not just the world. The third angel's message needs to be preached to all the churches, but to our church also. Amen. If we want to bring Adventists back to Adventism, we need to go to the foundations of our faith. Amen. Amen. All right, now, I'm, I'm saying a lot. But Luke 21, verse 24, the Bible says that they would, Jerusalem would be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, notice it says times of the Gentiles. Amen? We see that there? Amen. Connect this with me with Revelation chapter 11. And I'm going to start putting this in overdrive. Just because I need to get a few things done else and then I'm going to make a few statements and then we'll close. Revelation chapter 11. If you're interested, as you're turning to Revelation 11, if you're interested in going through the 2520 fully complete, whether you believe it or not, that's fine. Because you have to test this anyway. I don't want anybody leaving here saying that oh, I, I've seen all the light. This is truth without you testing it. You need to study this for yourself. So, but if you want to go through the full series, we'll show you how you can uh, avail yourself of those resources. But notice what your Bible says in Revelation chapter 11, beginning with verse 2. The Bible says, But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the who? The Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot. How long? 42 months. How long is 42 months? Verse 3. I will give power to my two witnesses. They shall prophesy 1,203 score days clothed in sackcloth. The 42 months is the 1,260 years. Amen. And what power in Bible prophecy is given 1,260 years to do its work of trampling down the sanctuary and the host? Roman power, but be specific. What Rome? The papacy. When is the papacy sat upon the throne of the earth? In other words, when is the abomination of desolation, the, the transgression of desolation set up? What is the date? We know it ends in 1798. 538. 538. So we go to 538. And we have 1260 years for the papacy. Amen? Amen. 1260 years for the papacy. Go with me in your Bible to the book of Daniel. I promise we're going to start coming to a close. I know we're tired. It's been a long day. But notice what your Bible says in the book of Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Brethren, do you know what our greatest joy next to just seeing and being with Christ is going to be for, for eternity? You know what the greatest joy is going to be? Studying our Bible. True. Studying the truth. I mean, we can spend eons and millennia studying the Bible. We better learn how to appreciate it now. Amen? Amen. So your Bible tells us in the book of Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, and it says in verse 6. Let's start in verse 6. And one said to the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for how long? A time and times and a half. How long is the time, time and a half the time? Three, three and a half years. Three and a half years or 1260 days or years in Bible prophecy. It says, for a time, time and a half, and when he shall have accomplished to do what? To scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. The scattering is accomplished at the end of the time, time, dividing of time. Remember, the scattering is the oath that God said he would put upon Israel and Judah for breaking the covenant. He said he would scatter them. The scattering is accomplished at the end of the time, time, dividing of time. That's 1798. All right? So for 1260 years, the papacy tramples underfoot the people of God. You with me so far? Amen. But remember, Daniel 8.13 asked the question, how long shall be the vision concerning paganism and the papacy to get both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And the answer is 2300 days. So paganism also has to trample underfoot the people of God. And this is an interesting thing if you receive it. 538 is the exact middle of the 2520 for the northern tribes. Therefore, paganism 
is also given 1260 years. Paganism treads underfoot the people of God in the sanctuary for 1260 years. The papacy treads underfoot the people of God for 1260 years. And 1260 plus 1260 equals 2520. 2520. All right, so the two decimating powers of Bible prophecy, this is the motif or the main element that the Millerites dealt with when they came to their understanding of Bible prophecy. But more than that is this. And at this point, I need to make a few statements and then we'll draw this to a close. And I'm, I'm telling you now, I'm not even doing justice to the 2520. There's a lot when it comes to the 2520. In the beginning of the prophecy, brethren, and, I, and I'll just say this now, the beginning of the prophecy, 742 B.C., Isaiah says how many years and then Ephraim would be broken, or how many years and within that time Ephraim would be broken? 65. 65 years. 19 years later, they were broken because it was within 65. Not in 65, but within Yes. So within 65 years, 19 years later, they are broken. That leaves 46 years, and then Judah is broken. We all together so far? Amen. We understand since we're talking about the 2300 days, how many, how many decrees went forth in order to come to the decree to restore and build Jerusalem? Three. Three. three decrees. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 14. There's three decrees. Cyrus, or Ezra, excuse me. Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes. So we have three decrees. One, two, three. It's the first decree, second decree, third decree, which is 457 BC. This is the 20, 2300 days. But were the streets and the walls finished? 457 BC? No. No. When we come to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2. Nehemiah is given another decree from Artaxerxes to complete the sanctuary and the wall. So you have three decrees followed by a fourth decree. All right? Now, follow me here. If there's 46 years and 19 years at the beginning of the prophecy, in order to complete the prophecy, there has to be 46 years and what? 19, 19 years. Between 1798 and 1844, is how many years? 46 years. This is 46 years. And what happens for 46 years? What happens during 46 years? Notice what Jesus says as we wind this to a close. Notice what Jesus says in John chapter 2. Mm. Notice what Jesus says in John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And let's start in verse 17. This is after Christ has cleansed the temple. It says in verse, we'll just look in verse 18. John chapter 2, verse 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in how many days? Three days. Three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty-six years was the temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his what? Body. His body. Now we understand in the primary sense, when Christ was talking about in three days I would raise it up, he was talking about him coming out of the grave. Amen? Amen. But what else is the body of Christ? The church. The church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. What is the body of Christ? The church. It's the church. God's people are the body of Christ. And how long was his church in building? From 1798, the power of the papacy is broken. God's people can now come out of her jurisdiction, out of her, her power. Enters in the first angel's message. You can read a great controversy. First angel's message comes into history 18 or 1798. You can read in volume one of the testimonies, page 21, second angel's message comes in 1842. 1844, October 22nd, you have the third angel's message. All right, so three decrees to rebuild the literal temple. Amen. Three messages to rebuild the spiritual temple. But remember, that's not finished because there has to be a 
Fourth. fourth message. That's the fourth angel's message. That's our day, but that's a whole other study. But here's the thing I'm trying to get you to understand. From 1798 to, 40, to 1844 is 46 years. This is the rebuilding of God's temple. Not literal, but spiritual. And when you get to 1844, just like what took place with Israel in the beginning, it happens in 1844. Israel entered into covenant. They became God's denominated people, his chosen people. And there's only been two denominated groups of people on the face of the earth. That's Israel, that was finally cut off. And then you come to October 22, 1844, and now enters the time of Laodicea, Adventism. Even though you can say, well, the Christian church, that spiritual Israel, yeah, you can say that, but they were never denominated and named as God's people. When a person is denominated, this is a marriage that takes place. Amen. And remember all the marriage parables Jesus thought about? You read Great Controversy, October 22nd, 1844, when Christ went into judgment, he went into the marriage. God is now married to his people once again. So you have 46 years in building, but we have to finish the 65 years, and here's an interesting portion. And this is just interesting. 46 years, and then 19 years, this makes a total of 65 years, just like at the beginning. You come to the year 18... 63. Now, the Bible is built upon many different principles. And one principle is that God illustrates the end from the beginning. God illustrates the end of the thing by the beginning of the thing. At the beginning, there is a war, a civil war, between the north and the south. And the leader of God's people is now forced with the decision as of what to do. Mm. When you come to 1863, what was happening in history? You have a civil war between the North and the South. And James White is faced with, a position, faced with a decision as what to do for God's people. In 1863, in order to keep God's people from being drafted, this was the whole reason why we have the establishment of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Not as a movement, but now as an official denomination. Mm -hmm. And the establishment of the denomination, historically, was for the purpose of keeping God's people from going into the draft. The leader of God's people, battle between North and South. The leader of God's people, battle between the North and South. 742 B.C., the proclamation of Isaiah is made to begin the 2520-year time prophecy with 723 and then finally 677. In 1863, the very first truth that God's people gave up was the 2520. The two charts, the 1843 chart and the 1850 chart, when you come to 1863 as a denomination, we cast these things away from us, and out comes the new 1863 chart. And the new 1863 chart takes away the 2520, takes away the understanding of the daily, takes away the 1290, takes away the 1335, and all it does is make prominent the 70-week prophecies. But guess what that does? And I'm going to end here. Guess what that does? It makes more firm the 2520. And I want to just illustrate something for you live, very quickly. Satan, in 538, you have the final doing away. In 508, you have the removal of paganism as a power. But the papacy is not established at 538. Satan does away with the first desolating power, paganism, to establish the second desolating power, papalism. And what Satan is doing is he is paralleling the gospel. Because the Bible says that Jesus would confirm the covenant for how long? One week. One week. Daniel chapter 9. He would confirm the covenant for one week. And in the midst of the week, he would cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So if I'm to draw this out here in miniature now. Here's the last week of Christ's life. We have his baptism, 27 AD. We have 34 AD to end the last seven years. In the midst of the week, we have the cross, 31 A.D. But this week period is seven years. We'll be all together that's seven years. How many days is in seven years? How many days are in seven Bible years? 25. 2,520 days. All right, there's 2,520 days in the last week of the covenant. He's confirming the covenant because the 2520 was issued upon Israel for breaking the covenant. 
So Christ comes to confirm the covenant, but what does he do? 31 AD, he does away with the first, that he might establish the second. He does away with the first sanctuary system, so one SS of the first sanctuary system. Then he establishes the second sanctuary system upon himself. He does away with the earthly to establish the heavenly. For 1260 days from 27 AD to 31 AD, the earthly sanctuary system is still in force. Then comes the cross. Now Christ is our lamb that has been slain. Now 31 AD, he's able to enter into the heavenly sanctuary to begin the work as high priest. And for 1260 days, now he's establishing the second. This is an exact parallel of what took place with paganism and the papacy. Amen. For 2,520 years. You can go all over Scripture and see the 2520. You read Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar's dream where he becomes a beast. How long has he become a beast? Scattered from his kingdom. Seven times. For seven times. 2,520 days. Then he's gathered back to his kingdom. It's a principle of scattering and gathering. Amen. You come to Daniel chapter 5. The history of Belshazzar. Belshazzar has this great feast, and all of a sudden a bloodless hand comes up upon the wall and begins to write on the wall. Now what does it write upon the wall? Many, many tekel yusfarsen. And what is many tekel yusfarsen? It's a weight. Weight in the balance isn't found wanting, but that word many and tekel and peris or yusfarsen is system of weight and measurement. We can show this in the Bible. It's a system of weight and measurement. And when you add up many, many tekel use farce, and guess what you get? 2520. 2520. Mm. So you have Daniel chapter 4, a principle of how the kingdom will be scattered but gathered back again. Then you come to Daniel chapter 5, illustrating a scattering and those who would never be gathered because Babylon was fallen that night. But a more interesting thing, I'm going to close my Bible. I'm closing my Bible. I have some statements I want to read, but the time I won't read them. Did Belshazzar know the history of Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather? Yes. When you read Daniel chapter 5, Daniel comes in and says, though you knew all this after going through the history of what took place with Nebuchadnezzar, he says, though you knew all this, you have pride swollen up in your heart. You've rejected your foundations. You've rejected your history. And so as a result of rejecting his foundations, guess what happened? The Bible says that night was the king of the Chaldean slain. Babylon was fallen. When you look at Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 4 is a symbol of the foundations. It's a message of judgment. Did, did Nebuchadnezzar learn what it meant to fear God in chapter 4? Yes. Yes. Amen. Did he learn how to give him glory? Amen. Yes. This was a symbol of the first angel's message. Belshazzar rejects that message. And as a result, in Daniel chapter 5, Babylon was fallen. And you have a symbol of judgment which is also a symbol of the third angel. First, second, third angel's message. And brethren, when we look at the foundations of our faith, well, this tells us a story, and I'm saying a lot of things that we can, be can be proven beyond the shadow of a doubt from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. These are the foundations of our faith. And the history of Babylon is not just a history for the world. It's about what will take place in the church. Because guess what? Belshazzar represents the new groups in Adventism. That though they may have known all this and heard all these things, they have cast these things aside. And as a result, Babylon will be fallen. And what is the message Babylon has fallen has fallen in our day? Revelation 18, that's the fourth angel's message, which is Sunday all time period. Brethren, when we reject the messages of our foundations, when we reject the foundations of our faith, not only are we going to be cut off and overthrown in the Sunday law, but the principle of the scattering and the gathering is taking place again. We are scattered when we cast off that which God has used to bring us into covenant relationship with himself. When God brought Israel into covenant relationship, he gave them two tables. Isn't that right? Amen. The first tablet, which had the first four commandments. The second tablet, which had the last six commandments. He gave him the Ten Commandments, two tables. When God entered back into covenant with his people, what does he give them again? He gives them the two tables of Habakkuk chapter 2, which we're told to write that vision and make it plain upon tables. 
But guess what? Like ancient Israel, we're rejecting our foundations. So just like ancient Israel, we'll be scattered. Not for a period of time, but ultimately once and for all. Either we're being gathered, and we're being gathered back to Adventism. Back into Christ. Christ in the spirit of prophecy. And we can give you all the statements. She says that these messages are the rock of ages. And she capitalizes them, making them a proper noun. These messages are a symbol of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the wonderful number. Jesus Christ is the very one who gives all these prophecies. And when we reject this message, we're rejecting Jesus. And so here we have a group of people in Adventism. When I say a group, I'm not talking about a small group. We have a large group in Adventism who have cast away the foundations of their faith. Many. Thinking still, still thinking that somehow we're Seventh-day Adventists. No. Maybe because we have the name. No. Maybe because uh, uh, we have the logo. or Maybe because we're in the church, our names are upon the church books. Brethren, what makes you a Seventh-day Adventist is not your membership in a church. <laughs> because Sister White says that she saw that there were uh, many names on the church books whose names were not written in heaven. Mm. And that's where it matters. It's the beliefs that make you a Seventh-day Adventist. Amen. And when we cast away our beliefs, what do we become? Adventism came out of apostate Protestantism. It was the belief structure that made us different, true Protestants. So when we cast away the foundations of our faith, we become what? We're going back to a long day Protestantism. Now, I don't believe the church is Babylon, so I want to just qualify that statement. The Seventh-day Adventist church will never be Babylon. Never be Babylon. But, you read in the Bible, God's people always do worse than the heathen. Mm -hmm. That's why we won't be Babylon, because we do worse. <laughs> See, Hill, chapter 16. That's not funny. That's not a funny thing. That's not a funny statement. In Ezekiel chapter 16, God calls his people a whore. And then says, No, you've done worse than the whore because you don't even receive money for your heart, for your for your actions. You're as an adulterous woman. That's the symbol of God's people. Well, it's about time that we go back to our husband. Amen. It's about time because he's willing to pardon. Amen. He's willing to make the, 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 the marriage vows new again with us. Yes. And either we will remain an adulterous woman or we will be married back to Christ. Mm -hmm. The 2520 teaches a whole lot of things. Yes. And as I said, brethren, we just barely scratched the surface with the 2520. But you can establish the 2520 through the cross. You can establish it through prophecy. You can establish it through history. You can establish it through all type of allegories in the Bible. Yes. Amen. Pharaoh's dream. Seven calves uh, blasted with the east wind or seven ears of corn. Then you have the seven cows. Remember the two dreams? Amen. And those represented each seven years. Seven years of gathering and seven years of scattering. Or 2,520 days representing gathering. 2,520 representing scattering. When it comes to the dedication of the altar, when you add up all the sum of the gold and silver, it just so happens to be 2,520 uh, 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 shekels in weight. Brethren, the Bible does not play in its words. There is something that we need to go back to. And the 2,520 is not just by itself. It verifies all of our beliefs. So now I ask you the question in closing. What is the second witness to October 22, 1844 to make it established? What is the answer to Daniel 8, 13 up to 2,300, well, excuse me, uh, 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 where it says, how long shall be the vision concerning paganism and the papacy to get both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden in the foot? The answer is not just 2,300 days. It's 2,520. That's right. The host trunk down, ceases. The sanctuary is now made right. The 2520 answers it all. Amen. This verifies activism. Amen. 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 Shall we pray? Let's close in prayer. <clears throat>